Okay, so this is Illegitimate Scholar. This is uh, Illegitimate Scholar Live weekly on Thursday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. California time. And we do this once a week. Usually it's uh, interviews with other people. I decided just to be lazy, not going to guest on tonight. But we're going to do it like we did it in the past, which is uh, we're going to do current events, which is something I moved away from a little bit because I'm trying to concentrate more on the, the culture stuff. But um, I think it's good for this week, and I think it's something we should add in sometimes. And I think Andrew uh, asked about that. Andrew asked about that in the Discord, and I will. Uh, I'll have to get back to him. Like he'll listen. He doesn't watch the show live, but he'll he'll hear this. So um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna start with a few current events again, which is something I haven't done in a while. Here we go. So Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden was indicted on federal gun charges. The indictment against the president's son comes after a plea agreement on tax and gun charges fell apart in July amid a probe of his finances by House Republicans. And I have done stuff with uh, the law a number of times on this show, both on Illegitimate Scholar Live when we've talked about my opinions on the indictments of Trump. And then also when there were a couple episodes that weren't live episodes where I think when Trump first got indicted, I put out an episode about the attacks on the institutions that we have. And we've also talked a lot about the institutions in America really losing a lot of the credibility that they have. And I've supported that in the past with statistics from Gallup and Pew Research that show the falls in trust in institutions over the last few decades, basically as far as they've they've taken records on them. In a lot of cases, that there's one specific one I've shared before where it's shown that 2022 and 2023 were the bottom of the barrel for a few different, like more than half of the institutions. And these are like public schools, big business. Like people do not trust stuff in America. And we should talk more sometime about Francis Fukuyama's book. Francis Fukuyama is most well known for writing The End of History and the Last Man, which is a it's a neoliberal book from the 90s, which I am really not a fan of that kind of gets made fun of a lot because they were kind of of this. This is pre 9-11 and they were like, oh, no, history's over. We're in. This is how it's going to be forever, which is like in hindsight. I don't know how people felt in the 90s. I was a little kid, but in hindsight, it's just crazy to say, like, just to think that like it's all over now, like we're all good. Um, like after the Yugoslav wars are over, it's like, no, nah, we're good now. It's all, it's all fine. We'll be good forever. And then nine 11 happens. And, and now there's Chinese and Kashmir and this freaking Ukraine and all these other things going on. But it does the the one thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, I did it again. I started talking about Francis Fukuyama when really what I meant to say was his other books. His, that's not a good book. End of history and the last man. But He did an incredible job with a two-part book series. It's a two-volume set, The Origins of Political Order and The the Origins of Political Order and something else, Political Order. But they're both about political order, and they're, they're about institutions being built and the importance of those. And those institutions are so important. And those institutions not being weaponized is very important. So uh, what it might surprise some of you to hear is that I'm actually not. I I don't like that Hunter Biden is getting indicted on federal gun car- gun charges. I mean, look, look, it's there's a lot of things that get pointed out. And I'm going to I'll cover this first is that, you know, people like Trump and people like Hunter Biden, well-connected, rich people generally get away with almost whatever they want. You know, like Joe Rogan smokes weed, and this is a minor thing, but Joe Rogan smokes weed in Texas, and he doesn't really hide it, and it's very legal in Texas, and there's a lot of poor whites and black people and plenty of regular people, not just really disenfranchised communities, but a lot of them are in prison. A lot of people are in prison for simple marijuana charges. So maybe it's not that minor, but when we're talking about like gun charges and things like this and the stuff that Trump is accused for, like this is the kind of stuff that they'll throw a normal person in prison for for years and not think twice about it. But at the same time, I cannot help but think that it is so standard. So I don't believe it's right that it's standard that rich, connected people get away with everything. I think that's very wrong, but that's the situation we have. So when you then have that situation and then that situation, exists and then it's used to indict a 
seemingly look, I, if you don't believe it's on political grounds that they indicted Trump, I, I strongly disagree with you. I think the evidence is pretty clear that it's very, it's, it's very much political, um, that he's being charged with anything. And I feel the same way about Hunter Biden being charged with these things. Like Hunter Biden was getting away with these things for decades and decades and decades. And I just assume that because of the decentralized political or excuse me, decentralized judicial system that we have, that that indictment of Trump, like that first indictment opened up all these other indictments against Trump because other prosecutors, it's crazy. It would be unheard of 10 years ago. Um, and they shouldn't be above the law. But if the practice is for them to really be above the law for a long time and then people start bringing charges, then like, what am I supposed to think? So I, I don't like it. I think it's bad. It's a sign of weaponization of the law and the law should be applied across the board. And we have problems, but this isn't the way to fix them. So Biden, um, we're talking about Hunter Biden. They shouldn't just say Biden was indicted Thursday. You can't. You got to say the full name. OK, Biden is Joe Biden, the president of the United States. Biden is not Hunter Biden, known crackhead and whoremonger. So Hunter Biden, known crackhead and whoremonger. Am I allowed to say that? It's okay. Um, was indicted Thursday in Delaware federal court on three counts tied to the possession of a gun while using narcotics. Um, two counts are tied to Biden allegedly completing a form indicating he was not using illegal drugs when he purchased a Colt seat. Dude, he wasn't using illegal drugs. This guy signed a form in 2018. These are the kind of things that like there's always going to be laws against them because you're always signing stuff and they can always get you. They always can. Any person in government, I, I can almost guarantee they've done something like this. So two of the counts carry a maximum prison sentence of 10 years, while the third has a maximum of five years. Each count also raises a maximum fine of 250000 the historic indictment against the son of a sitting president comes after a plea deal that might have ended a years long probe into Hunter Biden fell apart. And just as House Republicans have launched an impeachment inquiry in an effort to seek bank records and other documents from the president and his son. I mean, guys, our government's a mess. It's it needs serious reform. This freaks me out just as much as the Trump stuff. This is the kind of thing that just should not be happening. Um, and I assume there is some connection between stuff going on against Hunter Biden and stuff that's going to be used against Joe Biden. And frankly, it's it's better for all of us if this kind of stuff does not happen. But it's happening and it's a sign of the times and we need reform. So let's move on. McCarthy dares GOP detractors to file the motion if they want to remove him. Yeah, this is signs of a healthy republic. The Speaker of the House is daring his own party, the detractors in his own party, to file the motion. <laughs> uh, the remarks confirmed to NBC News by two sources in a closed door meeting. I assume it happened. I love that. Reflect renewed tension within the House Republican ranks as a government shutdown looms. So, <laughs> this is awesome. If you want to file a motion to vacate, then file the motion. He's calling their bluff. You know, I, I would do the same thing. Like if, if they're going to remove him, just remove him. If they're not going to remove him, move on. Um, you don't want to be in that gray area. It was a nod to members, including Republican Matt Gates. I have mixed feelings about this dude. Don't know enough about him, but he's been pretty prominent recently. Republican Florida and others who are threatening to force him out of the speakership if he doesn't comply with their demands, like putting putting certain bills on the floor and not passing a stopgap bill to prevent a government shutdown at the end of the month. Hmm. OK. Shutdowns are stupid, said Republican or Representative Dusty Johnson, Republican from South Dakota, a McCarthy ally and center right law lawmaker. Kevin McCarthy does not let these things get under his skin. OK, so let's get, let's move on again here. OK, let's talk about this. The UK legacy bill threatens Troubles era atrocity inquests. So what's happening here is in Northern Ireland, the Troubles, which is was the time of conflict between uh, Protestants, uh, Protestants and heavily associated with United Kingdom loyalists and against Catholics, heavily associated with Irish republicanism and um, Ir Northern Irish independence to join the Republic of Ireland, which is Ireland proper, whereas Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, along with England, Wales, Scotland and the Isle of Man. So 
what's happening here, the controversial Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Bill was passed by long lawmakers in the United Kingdom's House of Commons last week. This week, it will return to the UK's House of Lords, where it is not expected to face opposition and is due to become law within weeks or even days. The legislation will shut down new examinations of atrocities and other crimes committed during the Troubles, a prolonged civil conflict in Northern Ireland that pitted nationalists, mostly Catholic, and in support of joining the Republic of Ireland against unionists, mostly Protestant, and hoping to remain part of the UK. The Troubles killed more than 3,600 people between the 19, late 1960s and 1998, which ended with the Good Friday Agreement. So the legislation will shut down new exam and examinations of atrocities. So it's an effective cutoff date for ongoing inquiries and legal processes in little more than six times because of the fact that the UK left the EU and Ireland is in the EU and it creates a harder border between the UK and Northern Ireland and Ireland. And that's a problem for people. And so some of these issues are being reignited. So I'm not really sure how specifically the different, the different factions in this feel about this. I mean, there's Sinn Féin, there, there's a bunch of different parties, but I don't know how people feel, but any sort of this is a diff, this is a sensitive situation. I mean, this is our lifetime type stuff, and it's not just going to go away. So uh, these are a few of the the um, the massacres or massacres or injustices, whatever you call them. So Patrick Butler, 38, was shot by British armed forces in West Belfast on July 9th, 1972. One of five, including three minors who were killed that day by gunfire. Um in acts that are thought to have been in retaliation against a breakdown in the IRA ceasefire at Lenadoon, West Belfast, during the same day. Yeah. So he died while tending to the wounded at the scene. He's thought to have been shot and potentially killed by the same bullet that killed Father Noel Fitzpatrick, 42, in the West Belfast residential area. Yeah. Killed by the same bullet that the British shot and killed a priest. Thanks, UK. Appreciate that. Um, Patrick Crawford, 1975, Liam Shannon and Jim Ald, The Hooded Men, 1971. Um, in 1971, 14 Catholic men were allegedly tortured during interrogation by the British Army. That's a Tuesday. Great. James Eames, Double Murder Case, 1972. Okay, so this one, Ulster Defense Regiment, um, was carrying out checks of cars with Alfred Johnston on August 25th, 1972, when a command wire initiated device is understood to have been detonated, killing both instantly. So, yeah, we, we talk about these jokes of Irish car bombs, but real terroristic acts with with bombs. So this guy, James Eames, a member of the Ulster Defense Regiment Infantry. This is um, uh, so these were these were British soldiers, I think. And uh, they were killed by uh, freedom fighters. IRA terrorists, freedom fighters or terrorists. I didn't, I'm not, not passing judgment on that. They are both freedom fighters and terrorists. It's just a perspective thing. Um, but the insurgents, the IRA insurgents uh, killed them. This is not a one-sided thing. I think more Catholics were killed during the troubles in general. Um, but that's, that's pretty standard for occupations of this kind when the, the, the state level generally does kill more. Um, and, and that, that tends to be what happened, especially since in Northern Ireland, I mean, it's it, there were more Catholics, I think, even at this time. So it's charged with the double murder on the day via the alleged car bomb attack. The vehicle exploded as a lorry carrying 13 off-duty soldiers approached, injuring a number of them. And I guess it killed these two guys. So spy murder case. That interested. Yeah, so that's what they're talking about. And then, you know, in Northern Ireland, there's all these like different neighborhood things. So th this right here, if you're watching if you're listening you can't see it but it is a mural british flags ulster flags this one is a uh this is a protestant one but the catholics have similar ones okay great real happy stuff we're talking about today middle east roundup so it's a disaster in north africa morocco quake and libya flood so morocco's deadly quake libya's deadly floods 30 years since the oslo accords here's the middle east this week so it's the deadliest quake since 1960 in Morocco. And these are both next to each other, by the way. They're, they're, I don't know if they border each other, but they're very near each other. So both Morocco and Libya, these are in North Africa. 
and there were uh, just awful bunch of people. This place. Oh my gosh. Okay. So in Libya, countless bodies have been washed out to sea around the eastern port city of Derna, an area pummeled by Storm Daniel, causing the collapse of two dams. The numbers are staggering. More than five, more than 6,000 dead, 10,000 missing, 30,000 displaced while people race to bury hundreds in mass graves. And this is, you know, this is in Libya. This is uh, not the one in Morocco. This is in Libya. And that is made way worse by breakdowns in the country over the last decade or so with the destabilization and the death of Muammar Gaddafi at the hands of the West. Uh, I think specifically the U.S. essentially, but uh, Western backed militias. This was famously the country where Hillary Clinton laughed while saying we came, we saw he died or something like that and laughed. And it's uh, wrong. So the Oslo Accords, 30 years later, Israeli and Palestinian leaders met on the lawn of the White House in Washington to sign a deal many thought was a precursor to peace in the region. But the Oslo Accords, which earned its architect architects the Nobel Peace Prize, have accomplished nothing of the sort. Critics say it was inherently designed to serve Israel's economic and security dominance over the Palestinians. Yara Hawari further argues that Palestinian authoritarianism has its roots in the Accords. So that's great. Um, So yeah, there's terrible stuff going on in North Africa. You're probably not going to hear a lot about it because people don't really care generally in the U.S. about when a bunch of people in North Africa die. Okay. China unveils special measures to boost Taiwan's access to coastal Fujian. Uh, Beijing has promote, proposed transforming Fujian province into a zone for integrated development with Taiwan. And this is actually kind of a genius idea, I think, from the Chinese. And the reason is, is that you know China has had success with these special economic zones, especially when they first started opening up to capitalism where they there were free trade zones, and I think there still are, um, but they are economic zones where foreign companies could operate. And this allowed for companies to come in and for the Chinese to, the Chinese the, being the People's Republic of China, the mainland Chinese government, it, it created a situation where they could control what was coming in um, and they could control how it was being done and they could study it and they could select who's coming in and and they could watch how the free trade comes up because there are there's no rules or there's limited rules different rules in these special economic zones and that allowed them to not open it up to their entire country but to to have people come in on their terms and they had a lot of success with these and they expanded them and took certain policies nationwide and this is a lot it was a big part of their economic success now what they're doing here is they are So I'll just read what the article says. China will take a number of special policy measures, which reminds me of the special economic zones. I think the special in this context implies that it's like a particular, like it's particular rules for this particular area. Measures to improve access for Taiwanese enterprises to Fujian province across the Taiwan Strait, the Chinese state planner has announced under a long-term cross-strait integrated development plan. China will deepen the integrated development of the Chinese city of Xiamen Xiamen, and Taiwan-controlled Kinmen Islands. Kinmen sounds Japanese. That's probably not great. Including the acceleration of gas, electricity, and transportation links between the two, said Kong Liang, vice chairman of the National Development and Reform Commission on Thursday. The steps are part of a plan announced by China only Tuesday to turn coastal Fujian, Fujian in province into a zone for integrated development with Taiwan, with Ch- which China claims as part of its territory. Taiwan strongly rejects China's sovereignty claims. China has long offered Taiwan a choice between two pathways, peace and prosperity or war and decline. China's Air Force entered Taiwan's air defense zone again on Thursday and what the democratically elected, democratically governed island says constitutes regular harassment. I mean, that's probably true, but China supports the idea of allowing Kinmen located adjacent to Xiamen, 
despite being controlled by Taiwan across the strait, access to Xiamen's new airport, Kong said at a news conference. So, I mean, this is, there's been a lot of cultural things that the People's Republic of China has done to integrate Taiwan slowly. And I think this is just part of that. I mean, they're, they're integrating this area that's right across from Taiwan and they're allowing business to be done between them. And that's naturally going to create, you know, social ties between these people. I mean, certain people will get married. There's it's, it's likely they're going to do this in a way that allows them to have more control over time. And, you know, that's uh, works for them. I, this is, it's a slow burn, but it just feels like the people's Republic of China is slowly absorbing Taiwan. Um, and you can feel about that. How you do. I, I have mixed feelings myself. And then let's last thing with Taiwan, and then we're going to go into some architecture stuff. So Taiwan claps back at Elon Musk after China comments. Taiwanese Foreign Minister Joseph Wu, Joseph, huh, um, says Taiwan is not for sale after Musk discusses Beijing's stance on the island. So uh, what did Musk say? then proceeds to compare Taiwan to Hawaii, an integral part of Taiwan that is arbitrarily not part of China. Um, yeah, so Elon Musk is just spouting off Chinese talking points. I'm not surprised. I'm sure he does a lot of business in China, uh, PRC talking points rather. But then this guy is saying, listen up, Taiwan is not part of the PRC and certainly not for sale. The social media, Wu said on X, the social media site formerly known as Twitter, using the acronym for the People's Republic of China, Wu also said Musk should ask the Chinese Communist Party to allow X in China, where it is currently banned. That's a solid point. Perhaps he think he thinks banning it is a good policy, like turning off Starlink to, to thwart Ukraine's counterstrike against Russia. Wu said, <laughs> referring to Musk's decision to deny Ukraine's access to ac activate his Starlink satellites network to aid on Russia's to aid in attack on Russia's fleet in the port city of Sebastopol. Okay, so I just, before I move on here, I really need to say that he didn't turn off Starlink. He just refused to make it a part of the weapon. I think he made the right idea and he should do that to anyone, including the US government who tries to make him do that. So we shouldn't be setting a precedent where Elon Musk is privately using a, his Starlink satellite network to attack people. That's crazy. Please, no, I don't want to live in this corporate fascist world that they're trying to create. But yeah, it's not a surprise to me that Elon Musk is talking PRC talking points. Maybe he's trying to get X unbanned. I mean, if he gets Twitter unbanned, X unbanned in China, which I don't think is reasonably possibly going to happen, then I mean, he would it would certainly be worth well more than what he paid for it, like twice what he paid for it instantly and would probably grow over time. But that's not going to happen. I don't think that's that's real. I think he he still has to say that for other reasons. That's a thinking man stuff. I also stopped drinking. I mostly stopped drinking. I'm drinking a lot of fruit juice. That's what they do in the Middle East as well. I freaking love fruit juice. Now I don't have all these calories going to going to beer. I'm just drinking drinking fruit juice all the time. Love fruit juice. It's like Mother Nature's titty, I'm sucking straight from it. Love it. God damn, fruit juice is a good invention. That's one of the greatest things capitalism ever created. Fruit juice, man. They got a bunch of different fruits. You can get, you can go to the supermarket in Connecticut, you get a big old bottle of mango, peach, pineapple, all together. Tastes delicious. That is a marvel, man. You you just, just, you don't have to, you go to an island of uncontacted people, and we went over this recently of like uncontacted people and how there's not really uncount, uncontacted people, but like, you go to an island of truly uncontacted people or even like, you know, not contacted. Um, even though like like slightly contacted people and you go to them, you give them a, a glass of juice. Holy shit, man. Somebody's never seen a mango. That's amazing. Like, I mean, it depends on where they are. If they're living in a place where mangoes are, then they have. But like, like I saw this documentary once, man, and it was like cocoa farmers in Latin America or Africa. I think it was Latin America. 
And they they were like, yeah, we farm the cocoa and they turn it into like they don't even know. Some of them didn't know. Some of them knew, but they hadn't tried it. But all these people hadn't tried chocolate. And so they go to these cocoa farmers, cocoa farmers that hadn't tried chocolate and they give them a piece of chocolate. I think it was Hershey's. I was like, dude, you're giving these people chocolate. And they tried the Hershey's chocolate and they were like, wow, it's so good. I think I cried. I'm pretty sure I cried because I was like, damn, dude, these people are like they're farming this shit with their hands and they can't afford it. They were comparing like the price of it in America versus their wages. And it's, you know, it's different because it's just more expensive over here. But like even where they are, like they're they're in villages way out of the cities. If they went into the city, it would still be like a half a day salary for a chocolate bar, which is wild. So it's like they had never had it. They never had it. Cocoa farmers never had chocolate, didn't know what it was. And they tried it and they were like praising the Lord. And it's crazy. If you're just listening, I'm going to go over a YouTube video right now. If you want to see what I'm talking about, go on YouTube. But I'm going to talk and like kind of describe what's uh, what's happening. And you can listen as well. So this is like it. the opening picture is over this gorgeous neoclassical mission inspired style. I mean, everything blends together. Um, it, it's it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Lots of white uh, rooftops are similar. They're done in a similar style. It's culturally informed. There's no street signs, but you can drive cars on it. it it's amazing. It, it just looks like a utopia. And it's in the middle or it's like on the edge of like a apparently very violent city, by the way. So let's listen to this. You might not believe it, but what you're seeing now is all completely new. That's right. All you see here is built in the last 12 years because they built a brand new city in Guatemala that is absolutely stunning. And it could change the way how we think about how we should build cities. Cayala. The name of this city is Cayala. For this video, I interviewed two of the architects who worked on this project and who have seen it go from dream cool. to reality. Thanks, guys. The story of Cayala starts with a family who owns a beautiful plot of land in Guatemala City. The city had grown around this plot, which is perched on a hill surrounded by steep cliffs. But around the year 2000, the owners decide to use it to develop real estate. By chance, a young architect couple is connected to the family by their partner, landscape architect and town planner Mark Landers. They see an opportunity to create something truly great. Their names are Maria Sanchez and Pedro Godoy. They both went to the Notre Dame School of Architecture in South Bend, Indiana. The only offers a fully traditional design curriculum. So, like, did you guys just hear yeah, that? Only. Notre Dame, our very own Notre Dame. Love Notre Dame. Um, shout out Shane Gillis. Uh, so the Fighting Irish themselves is the only school in the world that offers a traditional architecture program. And that is awesome. I'm so glad they went there. Um, I assume they're Catholic because they're in Guatemala and they're white, um, which would make them probably very Catholic. So, yeah, let's keep going. But that I mean, that's awesome. That's awesome that they went to this specific school that keeps this tradition going. The school that was really doing something about it, it was Notre Dame. And we found an amazing academy in, in Notre Dame. Their education gives them a unique view on cities and places. One focused on creating places that are harmonious, human skilled and beautiful, and not only innovative or original. The plot of land asks for a special kind of master plan, and Maria and Pedro know exactly which urban planner could be perfect for this project. Leon Creer. Creer is not your ordinary urban planner. He believes in places that prioritize human skill over the dominance of skyscrapers and cars, and promotes an urbanism that fosters community instead of causing social isolation. He also promotes architectural harmony and the use of traditional design over chaotic haphazard construction, which we see everywhere nowadays. He is also well known for being a critic of modernist theories of urban planning and architecture. He makes these drawings that visualize these criticisms really well. They are quite entertaining. I can highly recommend this book, The Architecture of Community. Around the year 2002, the architect couple, who has started their firm Estudio Urbano, approaches Creer. They are not sure how he will react, but they are pleasantly surprised, because Creer accepts the challenge immediately. Before the involvement of Creer and Estudio Urbano, the family already has its own plan. Clusters of residential areas in the form of gated communities. Guatemala has some tough problems with crime. Many parts of the city are not safe to just walk around in. So many who can afford it choose for the safety of a walled enclave with security. But the concept of a walled city is not compatible with the vision of Leon Creer and that of Estudio Urbano. They have a plan that is far bolder. The concept was to bring the Christian city. 
that comes from the Persian Greek Roman city. So it is an open city. That was a, an issue at the beginning because the advice for the family from security was to enclose the city. But that was completely the opposite. So they brought thing up a, a few wanted. different things there. And it was, they brought up it being a Christian city uh, based on Persian, Roman, and Greek. And they brought it up as being an open city. And they, you know, the crime in Guatemala is really high. So this, I mean, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. But I really love that these people are addressing this in a way that, like, they're making this area. And yes, there are some rich people involved in this and they needed to use their money for this. But, like, that's how stuff happens um, is when like a, if, if like they can prove this as a concept that works and, you know, I'm skeptical, but from what I've seen here, it's been pretty promising. So it, I really love that they're trying to make it open um, like with people and, and possibly the ideas of a place like this and people can see what's possible and it can spread and become more economically viable. And, and these types of things are are just the really positive things that I love get added into the culture um, and affect our culture. And when I'm saying our culture, I'm talking about Western culture, including Guatemala, but like Western culture um, and how it's affecting Western culture positively, like affecting all of our culture positively. To do. And why to close it if we have Antigua Guatemala that is 45 minutes from Guatemala City and it's an open city. So that was the first like big step that was an asset for the whole development. The support of the family is not yet secured. They need to convince them that their plan will work. And so we convince them as a first step to, to do this charity, to have a, a really clear vision of the potential of the land. Of course, on that moment, everything was just ideas. We were breaking all the rules. All of these concepts that, that Leon Creer presented, I think made sense to them at least to consider. The plan is as follows. Small urban blocks with building heights of three to four stories are combined with a network of pedestrian streets and boulevards and welcoming public spaces. The city is designed to look coherent and harmonious. The buildings do not individually scream for attention, but they blend in. Yeah, like zoning just killed everything. You had zoning and then like one area can be residential, one area commercial, and it's just not mixed. And then They've started to mix stuff, but they do it, you know, if you listen to the architecture episode, they do it with stuff like five and ones where it's just super commercial, very not human, and it doesn't work with the rest of everything else. Whereas in this, the design is very human. It is a mixed use plan with apartments, shops, Gorgeous. restaurants, and office space. The plan even has a church, civic buildings, and beautiful The buildings are different styles, but they meet. work with each other. Really, really something cool. something else that is unique for Guatemala. The car is only welcomed as a guest. Because the land is owned by the family and not by the municipality, the designers had more freedom and could show how they made traffic slowing possible with almost no traffic signs. And without the use of curbs and asphalt, which is standard, or things like speed bumps. Instead, the meandering streets force cars to slow down to take pedestrians into account. It was a huge bet, but it worked. Directly from the beginning, the pedestrians naturally took over the streets. Another unique thing about Cayala is, of course, its architecture. <coughs> you will not find modernist glass and concrete boxes here, or other generic buildings that you can find anywhere on Earth. In Cayala, they fully embraced the local cultural identity. When you walk the streets, you feel like you are in Guatemala, not in Tokyo, or in Amsterdam, or Houston, Texas. To achieve this, they took inspiration from the rich building traditions that can be found in Guatemala. Architecture is a bit like a language, and here the architects learned and used the architectural vocabulary of the country to create new sentences. We are using the usual methods of construction of Guatemala, but they are done with a, with a traditional language that gives a continuity of the buildings one next to the other. You can really read the facades that are doing a coherent frame to the streets. Multiple styles and elements that played a role in Guatemala were adapted to the 21st century and integrated. Art Deco, classicism, Spanish colonial, but also the Mayan heritage. So they just showed a few different relevant. things, including like a set of stairs that was like really reminiscent of a Mayan, uh, Mayan step pyramid. Just incredible, incredible. If you're listening to this, like, I'm, I'm sorry, I know you can't see it, but even what they're saying is really good. 
maybe check out the YouTube video later. I'll uh, I'll have it linked in the Discord and um, in the in the show notes. Presented the Azaria Pavilion, for example, designed by Richard Economakis, has capitals with corn cobs. This refers to the Popol Vuh, an ancient Mayan text which describes the Mayan creation story in which humans are made out of maize. It is just a wonderful example of how architecture can be sensitive and respectful of place. And it is clearly appreciated. It's like the building steps a classical, a very popular place to seriously, hang out. It's a classical seen... building. It's like a classical temple where the um, the columns at the top and the bottom have the details instead of like, like Corinthian style or the different styles for Greek and Roman uh, temples and their, and their columns. It's done almost in that style, but with maize and it fits right in. And then this temple is on the top of a set of stairs that just look looks just like a Mayan step pyramid. It's amazing. It's just a mix of all these things. And then the buildings around it match it. I don't know if I'm like, I'm geeking out about this stuff. I think it's gorgeous. I think this is the coolest thing ever. And I really want to go to the city. Um, yeah, maybe sometime soon I can get down there because it's, it's just Guatemala. It's Central America. It's not even South America. Many people take photos and selfies there. No one seems to care that classicism is used. The people just enjoy the quality and the beauty of the place. But perhaps the nicest thing about Kaila are its details. The stone moldings and frames, the wooden balconies and the court of wrought iron fences and railings. They all give the plan an authentic charm. Finally, the plan is adapted to the local hot climates, with traditional clay roof tiles keeping out the tropical rains, and the colonnades and arcades that offer some protection from the scorching sun. It might sound too good to be true, but in 2009, the master plan is launched and construction begins. We were really nervous about that because it was the first phase. If it worked, they will follow. If not, <laughs> that's it. The open city center, Paseo Cayela, opens in sections. Parts are inaugurated in 2011, 2012 and 2017. But now it is completed, it doesn't feel new. It feels as if it has always been there. But what was very interesting is in the first phase, we did like 500 meters in which we have a civic building, a shops, office spaces, apartments. So from the day one, all the concept was there. In the inauguration, it looked like it was there for so many years before. You know, it's like it was a complete picture of what was going to happen. But also in the process, because this was like a new language, a new way of doing urbanism and architecture, people were confused. They didn't really understand it. It was a, a shopping center and it was open. You can walk in the streets. So it, it really was a, making a statement from day one. So how did they finance this plan? Wasn't it far too expensive? And didn't they lose money on all the ornaments and the beauty? Well, not exactly. First of all, the family that owned the land had a long-term stake in the plan. They didn't just want to earn a quick buck. Instead, they cared about leaving a legacy. And they understood that they could achieve this by doing something valuable for the city and its communities. The family understood that seeing real estate and development only through the lens of an Excel sheet and selling the land and real estate as soon as they possibly could would not be in their own best interest. They came to see that if they would create true value, a place where people would want to be, they would be the founders of a wonderful, popular new city. It turned out to be the right approach. Because the plan is so attractive, people from all over the city come to visit. This led to blossoming retail and increased value for the land and the property. It became so successful even that developers nearby Cayela now market their property in minutes of distance from Cayela. There's even a word for it, the Cayela effect. Many people seem to have a knee-jerk reaction when they are confronted with the option to build something beautiful. They only think about the possibility that it might be too expensive. But each beautiful project that has been built is proof that it is possible and very often quite profitable as well. Finally, we seem to think today that monetary value is the only type of value. But real value takes much more into account, like safety, livability and beauty. And real value, in turn, can lead to monetary value. They don't exclude each other, rather they go hand in hand. It didn't take long before a number of journalists started attacking Kaila in a number of hit pieces. In the articles they wrote, they claimed that Kaila was nothing but an exclusive, closed-off resort for the rich, surrounded by gates with armed men guarding it. Well, I was there, and I can assure you that the center of Kaila is indeed open. I didn't see any men with machine guns, and I didn't only see wealthy people. 
What I did see, however, were some residential parts that were closed off. And I did see some security. As crime rates are still problematic, this is unfortunately the norm for more luxurious real estate in Guatemala. In the best case, someday these gates will not be necessary anymore. Also, most of the apartments are indeed very expensive. It is, after all, premium real estate. So, is Cayala really only for the rich? And does the lack of affordable housing invalidate the entire concept? Well, when I visited, I observed something remarkable. Every day as the sun set, the streets filled up with a diverse crowd, with people from all different ages and backgrounds. If Cayala was really only for millionaires, then there sure must be a lot of millionaires in Guatemala. Jokes aside, I didn't have the impression for a moment that this was a place that tried to be a closed off resort for only one type of people. Instead, I saw how a variety of people enjoyed the spaces together, even though not everyone could afford a house there. The city center actually functions as one. It is a public space for everyone and attractive enough to actually visit. People just do some window shopping, get an ice cream, explore the intimate streets, or sit on the steps of the Azaria Pavilion to watch the sunset behind the volcanoes. There is enough to do without spending a penny. So, I mean, to... look, I, I just, I was letting most of this just speak for itself because I, I just think it's incredible and it does speak for itself. But I, I, the la I want to concentrate on that. Like you can exist someplace without spending any money. And in so much of so many cities, so many places uh, in the West, in America, especially specifically, it's just it, there's not a lot of places where you can just exist, where you can just be there and not be expected or required to spend any money. You can just be there as a part of whatever it is sitting and there's like value in that. And I, I see that with this and, you know, maybe it'd be better if you get, I, I don't know how expensive this stuff is there. I'm sure for a lot of people in, in Guatemala, it's a relatively poor country. They, they might not be able to afford it, but it seems like there's options of more expensive stuff and less expensive stuff with the street vendors and things, but it's just, I think it's, I, I think this is so incredible. I just, I love this and uh, I'm happy to share with you. We got a few more minutes on this video. Because it is a nice place to be. And that is incredibly valuable, not just financially, but psychologically and emotionally too. We are a multicultural country and to see everybody gather in the same space because public spaces are for gathering and even if we have different philosophies of life or different ways of thinking if you act in a very civilized manner you can be together and you can share the same space that is the purpose of cities i believe that what was done in Kayala can be a lesson to many it shows how striving for beauty harmony and community in an urban design leads to a win-win situation for the developer and most importantly for the people it teaches us that people vote with their feet, even when they have little to spend. People just want to be in nice places. If you build those for them, they will come. But although creating places like Kaila might look simple, it is not easy. We need more architects and planners who are trained to create beautiful, livable places with architecture that is respectful, harmonious and rooted in local culture. Happily, there is a university like the School of Architecture in Notre Dame, but there are also more and more summer schools that teach this way of planning, like the one in Utrecht this summer by Inpau, or the one in Belgium, organized by La Table Ronde d'Architecture. There's a great one in Spain too, and one by Create Streets in Britain. Until universities in Europe, Asia, even Africa start taking these skills serious again and shift their focus from frivolous concepts to the creation of actually pleasant places, there are little other options than these summer schools. But more on that in a future video. Finally, building beauty doesn't have to exclude people of lower income. As long as the public spaces are made accessible to all, everyone can profit. And the more we build that is beautiful, the higher the odds are that we can make it accessible to lower incomes as well. We have to start somewhere. And Kayala is a great example of the first steps we can take. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with a friend. Yeah, so or... the Aesthetic City is the YouTube channel. I'm not subscribed, but I'm going to. So shout out to the Aesthetic City.